Hi, my name is Max Lee. Thank you for listening to my story. I'm a student at UCSD and I live in California. I'm also a member at the UCSD chapter of Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. Most recently, um, I'm also a terminal patient who is um, advocating for the option of brain preservation. I think to really understand why I want or why I'm interested in brain preservation, I have to kind of go sort of into my life story a little bit and explain to people just the sense of purpose that I was building. Because at the beginning of high school, none of this was anywhere in my mind. I think I was just an awkward kid who didn't know how to make strong connections with you know people or goals beyond just getting good grades. And a major part of that transformation was the fact that I got really into robotics and I found a community there and I found a passion there, most importantly, that really helped to change my self-esteem. But the unique part about my team was it's entirely student run. I learned to really value independence, mentorship and good teamwork. And I was excited to apply those passions, you know, beyond just high school robotics. I mean, as fun as that was, I wanted to take on some ambitious challenge. That's exactly the moment that the cancer hit. I was having leg pains for a while in one of the competitions when we were running up to get our award. My dad was like, hey, you look like you're limping in, in that video. And I was like, ah, oh, it's, you know, it's just my leg been hurting for a little bit. It's probably nothing. It was really unplanned. I was about to launch into like this new chapter of my life. And I was really excited because I got into the college I really wanted to go to. I didn't end up going there because I had to do cancer treatment that would have overlapped with the start of Purdue's school year. That's all tolerable, but it's just the slow realization that the future that I wanted may not be the one that I get. And I knew that just from like looking into like, you know, the remission rates for the cancer that I have, osteosarcoma, even if the initial chemotherapy was effective, which thankfully it was, I knew that there was like a good chance that it would recur. I just tried my best to sort of ignore that when I was at UCSD and still put as much energy as I possibly could, you know, um, just living my normal life and hoping that I can work hard and succeed in the aerospace industry and do something really cool. I had days where sometimes my prosthetic would be giving me trouble and I couldn't leave my dorm for a couple of days. I found some joy in the fact that I was admitted into a very impressive group of aerospace students and other students who were just interested in space, um, which was the UCSD chapter of uh, SEDS or Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. I got into the propulsion team, which was going to design one of the first student made methane liquid oxygen rockets, which is a newer standard in the industry. It was a very exciting project to be sort of a part of. I felt like I was at once very terrified of what could happen if it all were taken away and amazed at the people around me and the possibilities and opportunities that were around me and to have that all crushed because I have these spots in my bones. When I heard like sort of my oncologist describing, you know, how badly the cancer had recurred, um, meaning that it had metastasized throughout my body in, 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 you know, eight or nine different sites in my bones. I pressured her and I, I asked her like, well, can you give me like some sort of percentage? I know that the data is not clear and you can't really estimate in that way, but is it so bad that you would say, you know, you, ha you have a high degree of confidence that I have a less than 1% chance of, of making this out alive. She replied pretty much to the affirmative. She was like, well, yeah, I would say less than 1%. When I got that diagnosis, my initial reaction was just despair, I guess. I was hoping for, you know, one version of my future. And now that's just completely gone. It seemed like life had just lost its purpose. That idea that solidified in me that I felt like I could determine my own purpose and pursue my own passions. I didn't know what to do with that anymore. It just, it was, it was useless. I remember just being unable to do anything and was just preparing for death. And, you know, the process of preparing to die is not the same for everyone. 
but for me it was the least energy that I've ever had I think in my entire life I just didn't feel the motivation to do anything um, besides one small thing which was making a scarf out of loop yarn for my mom to keep it's a little bit symbolic because while I was in the hospital she was crocheting a lot of things and so I wanted to make something for her so she can keep it with all her other stuff that she made throughout my treatment you know eventually I got back to doing the things that I think always bring me like some amount of joy which is like you know just getting lost in the internet following some of the developments in aerospace still it makes me excited about the future of space because this is just the beginning but it's not like I can just escape um, the sort of presence that the cancer has in my life now still dealing with treatment and going to the hospital regularly and so I'm, I'm like constantly reminded that I'm approaching death so I was reading about cryonics, which is really how I started looking into brain preservation, because that's like the thing that popped into my mind. Like, you know, don't people, <laughs> don't people like freeze themselves like after death and then, you know, hope for a revival in the future. Maybe this is an option that maybe this is, exists. So I, I found this New York Times article about this young woman. She was also a terminal patient. She was trying to raise the funds to get preserved. It was a sad situation because of how little like attention the science was getting. This article is like, you know, five years old. What I discovered was that there was great progress that was being made um, in this area, despite um, how little discussion or little trust um, most people have that uh, brain preservation will work, um, that mind uploading will work. This new brain preservation technique was developed called uh, ASC or aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation. It seems very promising. I was really excited. I thought this new technique, like this is what people have been wanting for a long time is to preserve the connectome. Like I saw a TED talk um, by Sebastian Sung, who, who, who's like, you know, a very prominent neuroscientist. He did that TED talk in 2010 where he mentions cryonics and he's like, let's put that to the test. Let's see if they can preserve the connectome. If they can preserve the connectome, then we can't say it's impossible. And so I saw that this progress had been made. So I was really hopeful. I was disappointed to find out that there's no like public discussion about this. This is being underexamined. If it turns out that ASC is sufficient in preserving long-term memories, then this would be a, a great missed opportunity that we have right now. It is sad that you know this desire is really strong and many terminal patients, not just me, who just really have a strong desire to still be a part of humanity's future and contribute in any way we can. I think it's a very sincere desire and the source of a lot of existential suffering that the medical system is equipped to address at least in some way rather than none. The way to do it, if at all, is through the medical system and through rigorous scientific debate and developments of the techniques that are being used to preserve people. It's super important to recognize that the option is different than your personal desire. Despite your views on the future of the world, what do you think about the preservation? Because I think there's two sides of this, right? Like there's how well things can be preserved and what are the chances that we can be reading off the information that's preserved in the future? Um, will there be humans left to read off of? That is so big and obscure, just leave that part of the argument out of this debate because people should have the freedom of choice to decide how they envision the future. The debate should be whether modern neuroscience believes that it's preserving the structures and molecules that do compose your personality and your, your memories, all of that, that can be reduced to modern neuroscience. Part of human nature is like just trying to improve ourselves. And so this is just one aspect of that. It's just an expectation that humanity will keep improving and that you want to be a part of that. If you would like to support the effort to establish brain preservation as an end of life option, possible ways to do so include calling for experts in neuroscience to publicly engage in the brain preservation debate, asking public figures to indicate their support for this idea, 
and sharing your unique perspective or insights on brain preservation in a public forum. Thank you for watching.